please go ahead and grab a seat. We'll go ahead and get started with our program. Thank you everyone for joining us today for the third day of the Subiendo Academy. We are at this halfway point. It seems that we, our students just arrived and here we've already been up for many, many hours and everyone's looking a little bleary eyed because you've been so busy working on your projects. But I wanna congratulate our students for taking the initiative to be part of the Subiendo Academy and for taking the initiative to be tomorrow's problem solvers because our state and our country are looking forward to your leadership and I want to commend you for being these young leaders that we need for our state. So congratulations to our students for, for being part of the academy. <laughs> Subiendo is in the eighth year and it would not be possible without our friends of Subiendo who make this program possible. And it's also because of corporate sponsors that, that make travel, for many of our students, the first time to, to fly possible. So Isaac Munoz, who is here with Southwest Airlines, we wanna thank you tremendously from the Academy for being with us and making 45 lives possible and getting here, so thank you. I'd also like to recognize Dean Jay Hartzell. He is the Dean of the McCombs School of Business and through his leadership, Subiendo exists. So we thank you, Dean, for having us part of your program. Thank you. We also have great table hosts who are taking time out of their busy schedules to join you today and are seated with you and are sharing not only their professional but their academic goals or what they've accomplished over their years. So I hope that you'll take the time to visit with them and put those networking skills that you've been learning for the past two days to work. So thank you to our table host for being with us again. Thank you. Before we introduce our keynote speaker, which Faith will, will announce our keynote speaker in a little bit, I wanted to show you a short video of, of the work, the great work that the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce does. And it's under Javier Palomares' leadership that it has flourished and has gained such noteworthy recognition. And I wanna thank you, Javier, for all of the leadership and inspiration that you've provided to so many young budding entrepreneurs, but also for the successes that are happening across the nation. So thank you for all that you do and continue to do. Thank you for being with us. Hola, everybody. Thank you, Javier, and everyone at the U.S. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. For more than 35 years, the USHCC has worked to make the American dream a reality for millions of Latinos. Thanks to you, entrepreneurs across the U.S. have been able to turn their ideas into successful businesses. And that's meant rising opportunities for entire families, even entire communities. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here with uh, the U.S. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I also uh, want to uh, thank uh, and congratulate Javier Palomares for all the great work that he has done. The U.S. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, I believe, is one of the most underrated organizations in the nation and must be recognized as one of the most instrumental tools of growth of our great country. The power, the courage, the entrepreneurial spirit, the lives of our Hispanic population. You know, every time I think about the uh, U.S. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, I think about the people and their stories. Uh, people like Javier, who was born into a uh, family of immigrant farm workers and of course has grown up to be the president and CEO of this uh, institution, this organization. We are honored to have the largest Hispanic Business Association right here in Houston, Texas. Speaking of friends, uh, there's another Javier, uh, Mr. President. Thank you for your uh, for your hospitality. It's good to see you again. And what's so important about the Hispanic Chamber, and I mean this sincerely, is that you reach back. You reach back. So many of you become so successful, you, but you never forget. You never forget. You reach back. Javier, I applaud you for acknowledging the power of America's businesswomen and the crucial role they play in ensuring the health of our nation's economy.
to introduce our keynote speaker, we have Faith Ahiwage. Good afternoon, everybody. Okay. Javier, Javier Palomares is the president and CEO of the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, America's largest Hispanic business association. The US HCC actively promotes the economic growth development and interest of more than 4.2 million Hispanic-owned businesses that combined contribute over $668 billion to the American economy every year. It also advocates on behalf of 200, 260 major American corporations and operates through a network of 200 local chambers and business associations nationwide. A pioneer in multicultural marketing, Paulo Mares has more than two decades of corporate experience and entrepreneurial insight. His, he began his career at Allstate Insurance Corporation, where he worked to initiate the industry's first fully integrated nationwide Hispanic marketing, sales, and service campaign. Following his tenure at Allstate, Paulo Mares was recruited by Sprite Incorporation where he rose through the ranks to become the Vice President of Marketing, Marketing and Public Relations. Following Sprint, he was recruited to Bank of America, where he served as Senior Vice President of Multicultural Marketing and was responsible for advertising, marketing, sponsorships, and public media, media relations to help position this global leader in the financial services industry. Paula Mares is a proud American from Texas and currently resides in Dallas and Washington, D.C. Please help me welcome Javier Paula Mares to the stage. Thank you. Wow, what an introduction. Um, Leticia, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Uh, Faith, thanks for that wonderful introduction. You read it exactly the way I wrote it. So that was perfectly done, Faith, thank you. Uh, dean, thank you for being with us today. I'm still trying to impress the dean. I graduated school, I don't know how many years ago, but when the dean's at the table, you do your best. Um, it's a real uh, honor to be here, um, truly a pleasure. Uh, as uh, Faith and Leticia both said, my name is Javier. Palomares, and I'm the president and CEO of the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. And I'll just refer to, you it, refer to it as the USHEC from this point on because it's uh, just too long a title. Now you're probably wondering what the heck exactly is a Chamber of Commerce? Well, to keep it simple, we are a membership organization that works to ensure that those that we represent have every possible opportunity to succeed. And as Faith said, we work on national policies, legislation, and programs that benefit our members. And as she said, we do in fact represent now 4.2 million Hispanic-owned companies in this country that collectively contribute over $668 billion to the American economy every year. The Hispanic community is leading business growth in this nation. And in fact, it is American small business that creates two thirds, almost 70% of all new jobs in this country. And the fastest growing segment of American small business is the Hispanic community, starting up new companies at a rate of three to one when compared to the general market. Faith also mentioned that we advocate on behalf of now 270 major American corporations, and we serve as the umbrella organization for more than 200 local chambers and business associations nationwide. But I think it's important to recognize that while we represent men and women who happen to be of Hispanic descent, we never forget that we are first and foremost American businesses. And every tax bill that we pay, every job we create, every product we manufacture, and every single service that we provide goes to benefit our American economy. And it is a special honor to be here with you. And that's because you quite literally represent the best of Texas and the very future of our nation. It is your hopes and your dreams that will spark 
the next wave of American ingenuity in the arts, sciences, and yes, even in business. Just the fact that you're here as part of this remarkable Subiendo program means that you are already off, frankly, to a great start. And I know that you will take full advantage of your time at UT this week. Please listen to the speakers, even me. Talk with the professors. Take a look at the dorms. Explore the campus. Learn about each other. And think about what your interests and your passions are. And please do yourself a favor and ask plenty of questions. I certainly wish that there had been a program like this when I was your age, back in the Stone Age. In fact, it's hard to believe that I'm standing here before you, given my own background and my upbringing. You see, I come from a very humble home, very humble be beginnings. I was raised in the Rio Grande Valley. That's here in Texas. Oh, we have some RGVs in the house. Mira nomás. Look at that. Who'd have thunk it? I was the youngest of 10 children. And when I was six years old, disaster struck. Suddenly and unexpectedly, my father abandoned my family. So my mother, my nine brothers and sisters, and I were left to fend for ourselves. And for many years, we earned our living as migrant farm workers. We picked crops by hand, tending the field from sunrise to sunset. And at the end of a very long day, we'd come home to a one-room shack with no running water, a small butane stove as a kitchen, and an outhouse for a bathroom. Today, I fly on Air Force One. I visit the White House whenever I want. And I hang out with ambassadors, presidents, former presidents, wannabe presidents, never going to be presidents, <laughs> secretaries. And that's a life that I've lived up to this point. And that's a life that awaits you. Now, now I never imagined growing up as I did as the son of immigrants, learning English as a second language, dropping out of high school, and eventually graduating from college, where my life would take me. By the way, the college I graduated from was UT, so hook them. How, how could I have dreamt, how could I have dreamt that I would find myself here today, all these years later, back at UT? talking to all of you as you are about to launch the exci this exciting phase of your lives. But as you prepare to make some big decisions at this pivotal time, I think, in fact, I know that things can sometimes seem overwhelming. Now you're probably thinking, what the hell does this guy know about my life? I mean, look at him, he's like 100 years old. What, what would he know about a teenager? Well, I might be old, but I am aware. For example, I know that the weekend isn't just in reference to Saturday and Sunday. <laughs> am I right? I know that it ain't boo anymore, it's now bay. <laughs> um, I know that old guys like me Facebook, but y'all Snapchat, and I neither snap nor chat. I've heard that my suits and my silver hair are on fleek from time to time. <laughs> So, again, I'm, a, I'm old, but not dead. <laughs> so, as you contemplate your next steps, I want to share just three very simple lessons with you that have helped me. Lesson number one, mindset is more important than skill set. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but consider that real success in life is not about luck. It is about managed thought focused attention and deliberate action. In other words, success starts with the right mindset. This principle is as simple as it is important. Now think about it. You've succeeded in school up until now because you've actually learned how to learn. You've had the discipline to dedicate yourself to it. And for the past three or four years, 
you've rightly focused on studying hard, preparing for what comes next, and earning an oh-so-high GPA. But in, in the reality that awaits you beyond high school, those things will only take you so far. Because in the final analysis, it is your character and your willpower. The very things that got you to this point, those are the things that will carry you further in life than anything else. In your studies, your life, and your career, there will be times when you will be physically and intellectually spent. And yes, there will be times when you will be disappointed, even downright unhappy. But as Robert Holden once said, beware of the idea that happiness is in the next place, or the next year, or with the next partner. Until you give up on the idea that happiness is somewhere else, it will never be where you are. There will be plenty of obstacles in your way. Just make sure that you don't allow yourself to become one of them. So I encourage you to never stop learning, to continue to build your knowledge, continue to hone your skills, but remember that despite your credentials, your education, and your pedigree, there will be times when your future will look uncertain. The odds will be stacked against you and your prospects may look bleak. In those times, you must steal your mind and set yourself for success. Remember who you are. And remember that you get out of life what you put into it. And that the only thing more important than your skill set is your mindset. Lesson number two. Tell me who your friends are and I'll tell you who you are. There's an old Spanish adage, dime con quien andas y te diré quien eres. Now, how many of you have heard that before, right? But what exactly does that mean? I think that it means that your friends don't define you, they reveal you. Our friends are a window through which we see more deeply into ourselves. They are a silent affirmation of who we are. And when you leave high school and go into college, you will trade one set of friends for a new set of friends. By the way, when you leave college and go in your professional life, that exercise will repeat itself. Even though you think you'll be friends for life. The reality of it is that friends are the family that we choose. Friends can push your buttons and also push you to be better. They test your loyalty and they offer you theirs. But how does one find the right kind of friends? Well, I think you have to start with yourself. As Emerson once said, we must be our own before we can be another's. I believe that what he meant was that the only way to truly have a friend is to be a friend. You must be that which you seek. Your life and your career, for sure, will take twists and turns, leading you in directions you can't even imagine right now, even when you try to plan it. But your friends, if you choose them wisely and you treat them well, will be there for you no matter where life takes you. A good friend emboldens us to dig deeper, to set our sights higher, and to lead lives bigger than ourselves. Our friends are a reflection of who we are. Dime con quien andas y te diré quien eres. Tell me who your friends are, and I'll tell you who you are. Lesson number three. Never measure wealth in dollars. In high school, in college, and in life, you will come across people from vastly different economic backgrounds. And unfortunately, in our society, it's easy to confuse money with meaning. And I know a lot of people, way too many, frankly, who try to find their meaning in their money, who try to define who they are by what they have. But don't be fooled. 
Learn this lesson now. Instead, I challenge you to measure wealth as having a purpose. Measure wealth in the number of lives you touch and the number of lives that touch you. That, that is real wealth. Wealth is in the strength of the heart, a heart made richer and stronger by the number of memories, smiles, and tears it has lived through. And perhaps the greatest wealth in your life will be your family or a life partner who celebrates with you during good times and lifts you up during the bad. I'm not saying that money isn't important. Trust me, it is. We all know that it is. So absolutely, be financially responsible, learn to earn, to save, and to invest. But never, never let a salary rule your career decisions. And on your journey, surround yourself with people who dream with you, who dream of you, who laugh with you but never at you, who cry for you, cry with you, and who every now and then bring a tear to your eye. People who help you realize that the purpose of life is to live a life of purpose and that we should never, never measure wealth in dollars. So there it is. Simple, right? To summarize, always strive to keep the right frame of mind, lesson number one. Lesson number two, surround yourself with those who wish to see you succeed or in your parlance, keep the right squad, right? And lesson number three, when you do succeed, and you all will, never measure that success in dollars. As I look around this room, I see ambitious faces. I see hope. I see a future that shines brightly in the eyes of tomorrow's leaders. And as the old song says, the eyes of Texas indeed are upon you. But so are the eyes of your community, in your country. You are the future. And I know that one day we will all marvel at the remarkable contributions that you've made and the careers that you've built and the countless lives that you have all touched. In fact, we're already amazed by what you've accomplished. So in closing, please remember that we believe in you, your faculty, your friends, and your family. So never, never stop believing in yourselves. Thank you, and I wish you all a wonderful, wonderful day. Go. Go Longhorns. Are, are there any questions of our keynote speaker? If so, come ahead and line up at the oh mic, boy. and if you want to get the podium, that's better. Okay. I think we have time for about... Uh, hello, Mr. Palomares. I am Sandil Rothschild, and I feel akin to you because I, too, am from the Valley. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. So, sir, I want to ask you today, uh, because you, in my point of view, seem to be a very successful man, a well-learned man. Mm -hmm. Sir, surely you went through this in your younger days, and surely everyone in this room has, too, that there are people back home who we call our friends. We share good times with them. We share a meal with them. Sometimes we have, uh, we laugh. However, we know that they can be worth it. That they can be so much more. Their gem cells just waiting to be cleaned. And we're willing to reach down and help them up. However, it's always just a few inches too far. And they make no attempt to, you know, better themselves. Mm -hmm. How can we let them know that there's so much more to the world? That they too can be great. Well, you know, I think that's a great question. Um, I, I certainly came from a background where uh, there weren't a lot of examples of, of, um, of uh, traditional success as we define it today in the world I grew up in, migrant farm workers. Um, you know, getting a high school education was a big deal. So going to college was unheard of. And I remember people arguing with me, you know, what, what do you want to learn English for? I mean, what, what, what do you want to learn that for? You're, you're fine the way you are. And it became apparent to me, predominantly because I was raised by the right woman, that you know, life is out there to be taken. And um, 
the world is so much bigger than the Rio Grande Valley. It certainly was for me. Um, and oftentimes, you know, you have to, you have to divorce yourself from the environment you're in. And sometimes that means um, moving on and leaving friends behind that maybe don't have the same interests you have. But with that said, you know, I think that as my personal view is that there's always time to give back. There's always time to stop and, uh, and encourage the next person. You know, success is one thing, but when you reach success, you have an accountability, um, particularly in the Latino community, and I think communities of color in general in this country. There's so much more that needs to be done. If you think about the potential of the Hispanic community today, every 30 seconds a Latino turns 18 in this country and becomes an eligible voter, and yet we have the most abysmal voting record as a community. Imagine if we, if we empowered ourselves and we took action. Um, but it doesn't happen in a vacuum. It, it happens because there are those who are spurring that action and moving it forward. So I guess in a nutshell, you know, I've had to leave some friendships behind because they frankly were a drag to me. And I've sought out those who wanted me to succeed, who pushed me, who challenged me to keep up. And those are the friendships that to this day still matter to me. But even in that reality, there comes an accountability to always stop and do like what I'm doing today. Um, you know, I'm a businessman, so what business do I have talking to high school students? But the reality of it is, you know, we're gifted with things. And, um, and when you do have that success, there's an accountability to try to share it as best you can. That's the best answer I can give you. You know, I wouldn't, wouldn't go any further than that. But you'll make the right decision, and you'll pick the right friends. Just make sure that they're the ones that push your buttons and move you forward and keep you moving. Thanks for the question. Appreciate it. Go RGB. Thank Thanks. Appreciate it. And you didn't have to put your coat on to ask a question. You know, you can ask it in your... Hello, sir. My name is Carmen. I'm from El Paso. Uh, first of all, it is, it's quite an immeasurable honor to be speaking to you. Uh, my, Likewise. I do have a question. Uh, my first question um, I'd like to inquire. I understand you went through the business route to get to your current position. And as someone who is very interested in politics, uh, but more so interested in more of a journalistic aspect to it, how do you get to this kind of position to where you're really able to impact the community on a leadership level? Well, I would tell you that um, in my particular case, and I would venture to say it's probably the case for anybody who's attained any level of success, you don't do it by yourself. Nothing worthwhile is done by oneself. Um, in my case, I have you know, my chief strategist sitting right over there, Devere Kutcher. Devere, stand up and let the kids get a good look at the brains of the operation. Um, I, um, I work with a, a very young team of people back in Washington. Um, we are a very small staff of about 10 of us, but we have a good mix of everything, African-American, male, female, um, Hispanic, non-Hispanic, uh, Argentinian, Colombian, Cuban, old Mexicans. Um, so I think the first thing I would say is um, that nobody does it alone. One of the things I had to learn very early on was how to ask for help, how to prepare myself to receive the help when I asked for it. Um, secondly, you know, I believe that small business should have a voice in this country. Um, most of the time in the world that we live in where business and policy kind of intersect, you see the large corporations there. You see the GEs and the Goldman Sachs and you see the Bank of America and all of those companies support our work. All of those companies and their CEOs are dear friends of mine. But rarely do you see an organization that repre represents the little guy. And yet when you think about it, it is American small businesses that create two-thirds of all the new jobs in this country. So we should have a voice. So as it relates to kind of policy and politics uh, and business, there's an important intersection. And our community has not unlocked that secret of how do you work in that space 
where these two worlds collide or interject. We do a lot of that work. Um, and that's why we were the first organization, Hispanic organization in the history of this country to ever host a presidential Q&A series. And we had everybody from Ted Cruz to Bernie Sanders to Hillary Clinton to Martin O'Malley to John Kasich to Jeb Bush. And in fact, the only one who backed out at the last minute was Donald Trump. I did see you met with his transition team in January. I'm sorry. I, I did see you met with his transition team in January. I remember you were saying you, want, you wanted to, you were working closely to ensure the business productivity, basically. Yeah. Do you feel that that's being followed through? No, I don't. Uh, I think there's a lot work yet to be done. Um, the reality of it is that uh, this president has picked a, in some cases, a very good team on the business side. Uh, in terms of business policy and the business agenda. You have leaders like even Tillerson, who is a proven, you know, has a proven track record as a business builder and a job creator. Uh, you have people like uh, Steven Mnuchin, who has a track record of, you know, a great investor, great business build builder, understands economic issues. Uh, you have people like, uh, like Ross, who, who also gets it. Um, we work with the people on that side of the administration who are doing kind of business policy and economic growth, uh, driving the economic growth agenda. But frankly, this White House is embroiled in so many other things that are frankly counterproductive. Um, and therein lies the challenge for all of us, not just for that administration, for all of us. And um, I, you, know, I, you may know, I don't know if you did your homework, but. Uh, if you did, you know that I was dead set against this president. I, I referred to him as a clown. I referred to him as a payaso. I said he was unfit for the job. I called him a buffoon. I said he was an idiot. All of it on national television. But you remained very diplomatic when meeting in professional measures, which was quite amazing, by the way. I don't know how. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, well the, the entire team trying to promote the Hispanic community, I think, has really received all of this, some of the backlash as a production, very... Yeah, yeah. We have, um, you know, at, at, at the end of the day, leading an organization like the one that I lead is, is, is it's not a popularity contest. You know, you, you have a job to do, and your job is to represent the interest of American small business. And that means that you have to have open dialogue and frequent dialogue with the administration in the White House, regardless of who's in the White House, whether it's a man, a woman, white, black, male, female, Republican, Democrat, it doesn't matter. Your job is to have access to that White House and be able to advocate on behalf of American small business. Whether you like the person personally or not, that's not what they pay you for. And so in my role, I have to divorce my mind from my personal views and keep my responsibility to my constituency front and center. And I have to say, in full candor and honesty, that this White House has been very willing to talk. We were on the, we were on the phone with the White House earlier today. Um, we will be meeting with them on the 24th of this month and the 26th of next month. Um, we have met, I don't know, in the last five months, probably a dozen times with members of the administration because we have a job to do. And that job is to continue to represent American small business and our Hispanic small business community. It's a tough, it's a tough row, but it's the, it's, it's the job at hand, and we intend to do it. Thanks for the question. Um, hello, Mr. Palomares. Uh, my name is Dollar Feldo from El Paso, Texas, and like. They said before me, it's truly an honor to stand here before you today. Likewise, thanks. Um, my question for you today is, how is being part of a minority group both a barrier and an encouraging factor to your career path where you now um, really inspire thousands of lives every day? Wow. Well, I remember I did a conversation like this at a school in... Um, Salt Lake City, Utah, and they asked me to get up and talk to the crowd kind of extemporaneously. It was not prepared. And uh, Devere was with me as usual. And I remember I couldn't think of anything to say, anything like prolific. And it occurred to me that 
um, there was a man who stood directly behind my little table. There was a bunch of tables in this very quiet, very elegant room. And that man's job was to keep my water full. And he asked me whether I wanted sparkling, ice, no ice, tap, bottled. I mean, there were like six different choices to make about my water. And there were two different water glasses, and both of them were for me. And I always have a flashback in life um, when you go through things, I think you carry stuff with you. And I had a moment when I was standing there talking to this crowd that I said I remembered <clears throat> as a little boy we would pick crops all day long. And it was dusty and it was hot and it was uh, in the Midwest usually. And um, this one flashback I had, we were picking corn, and corn can be very sticky and very itchy, <laughs> especially when it's hot. And in the middle, and this is before, you know, Yeti coolers and stuff like that. And um, in the middle of the day, the farmer would drive up with these big barrels of water, and he'd sit up on the truck, and you'd walk up there, and he'd put, take a ladle and dip it in the, bo in, the, in the barrel of water and hand it down to you. But before he handed you the water, he would put the ladle down there empty and you took a nickel from your pocket and you put it in the ladle. And he would take that ladle, put his dirty hands into the ladle, pull out the nickel, put it in his pocket and put the ladle in the water and bring it down to you. And then the next guy would take his turn and he would take his nickel and put it in the same ladle. He would take his, the farmer would pick it up, take his dirty hands, put it in the ladle, same barrel of water. And since I was a little boy, when people ran to the water, imagine this line right here, I would be like the 15th guy down. So by the time that ladle got to me and I put my nickel in it, 10, 15, 20 grown men and women had put their dirty hands into that same ladle and their saliva and everything was going back into that barrel time after time after time after time until it finally got to me. And I would put my nickel in there and they'd give me my water. And I had a flashback. And I'm sitting in this room and there's a guy whose job it is just to keep my glasses of water full with cold, crisp, clean water. That's happened in my life. If it, if it can happen in my life, it can happen in anybody's life. So I carry my culture and my, my upbringing and my, my hardship with me all the time. And it's a funny thing because you get these thoughts randomly in the middle of stuff. But I, you know, it brings me down, but it also feeds me. It also it also drives me because I know that it's possible. And I know it's possible because I'm living it. Now I fly on Air Force One and somebody's job to bring me water and ask me what I want to eat for breakfast while I'm in the air. And it's hard to believe it sometimes. I have to pinch myself. But here I am. So I let that hardship and I let that difference and that feeling of disengagement when I was a younger man drive me today. And we have a saying in our office, we have many, but one in particular that says that the, uh, the pace of the leader determines the speed of the pack. And my staff jokes that I don't sleep, that I wait. Um, and I am a workaholic. But that sense of always having something else to do and something else that needs to be resolved. And if somebody isn't fixing that, well, by God, we'll go fix it. Um, all stems from this feeling of once being disenfranchised and once being told you're not good enough, you don't belong, you shouldn't be here. And today, I'm good enough, I belong, and I am here. So I hope that answers your question, but long-winded answer. You should have been warned, my answers are very long. But I hope that answers the question.
once again, um, thank you for coming out and sharing your story. Thanks for having me. Um, the question that I have is, as a young leader or for any young leaders around the world that has a passion or interest of creating an organization to influence or change our society, what steps should we take now for it to become a successful and a reality for us in the future? So as a young leader, what should you be doing now to prepare yourself? Yes. To able to have a successful organization to help our society. You know, I think the first thing that drove me and Devere and our third partner in crime, which is a woman who's back home in DC right now, handling the work, um, we didn't set out to be leaders. We, we didn't have in mind, you know, we're gonna go be leaders. Um, we set out to make a difference. And in the process, we've done things that have been kind of, wow, that's never been done before. We had the very first ever White House Hispanic Business Summit in the history of the country. Um, we were the first Hispanic organization to refuse to take money from the government. We don't take a penny from any government entity of any sort. And people thought that was heresy. We're the only organization of our kind that has a board that is exactly 50% women and exactly 50% men. And every one of them is an amazing business leader. And there's a, just a series of firsts that we've kind of been able to create. But our driving, our, our momentum and our, and our inspiration was not to be recognized as leaders. It was to make a difference. It was to find where our community wasn't being recognized. And you know, when we came on the scene eight years ago, there were a lot of Hispanic organizations doing the Lord's work. They were doing the right work and they were advocating on behalf of Hispanics. But it was always from a social and civic aspect. It was always about the social issues and the civil rights um, uh, perspective. And rightly so, it's important work. It needs to continue. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for organizations like that. Amazing organization. But nobody was talking about Latinos in the context of our entrepreneurial DNA and the contributions, the economic contributions we make to our country. And so that's where we went. We wanted to give voice to our community so that presidents and wannabe presidents and every single senator comprehends the importance of this community and what we mean for the continued well-being of this country. That's what we wanted to do, and that's what we have done. But the impetus for that, it, it, it wasn't predicated on wanting to be leaders. Um, we never knew whether anybody would even notice it. We had no idea, none whatsoever. Uh, and today, you know, they call us leaders often. But for us, it's more about making a difference. So I would, I would ask you to ask yourself, if you want to be a leader for the sake of being a leader, question that motivation. But if you want to go make a difference, then go make the difference. And leadership will come. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, first and foremost, thank you for being here. My name is Samantha Garcia, and I'm from Brownsville, so I'm representing the 956. I recently read a claim, uh, I recently read a claim by Hispanic author Richard Rodriguez, where he stated that Hispanics are always fighting to be more than Hispanics and are always trying to fight the minority status, but they always take up a step back and they're always reaping the benefits. When analyzing this claim and trying to make my own claim, I kind of came up with something on my own and it was in the place of Brownsville, like at least. Whenever I say I want to go to college, the people around me are always pushing me and they're saying, well, you're a woman, you're Hispanic, and you're smart, you're gonna go somewhere. But when I say I want to go to Harvard, the same people that are pushing me forward take a step back and they say, do you know how expensive that is? Yeah. I guess my question to you is, if Hispanics are always trying to fight, how, what can I do in my community to at least inspire them to think more than UT, think more than A&M, think more than staying in the RGB, and to think more than defying like the minority status, because yeah. although Hispanics do want to be more than Hispanics, yeah. there's still a limitation. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, our commu many communities, but certainly ours, I'm not an expert on a lot of things, but I'm almost an expert at being Hispanic. I've been Hispanic for 56 years, so I've, I've, I've almost got it. Um, we tend to limit ourselves um, more than we should. Um, and I think that's driven 
predominantly because we don't have a rich history of a lot of Latinos going to Harvard in the first place. But that may also be driven by the fact that those that do go to Harvard move on and don't come back. Don't come back to Brownsville or to Austin and say, hey, listen, if I can do it, you can do it. Here's my number. Here's how I help. What can we do? How do we change this dynamic? How do we increase the numbers? Um, there's an old uh, story that I grew up hearing all my life. It's called Mexican crabs, where, you know, if you're, if you're a crab in the Mexican bucket and you're trying to get out, don't worry, you know, all the other crab, all the other Mexican crabs will jump on you and drag you down. You're never going to make it out. And, you know, maybe that's true. I'm not sure. But I believe that you're accountable for two things, in, in my personal opinion. And that's what I've looked, the way I've managed it. One, I'm accountable for getting out and getting up. I'm accountable for making it. But then I'm accountable for coming back and saying, okay, people helped me. There was someone, there was always someone there for me. There always was. Usually not Latino, by the way. Usually not Hispanic. And so my job is to come back and say, okay, who can I help? How can I help? Where can I help? And so I would tell you that if there are people around you that say, yeah, yeah, absolutely, go to college, it's fantastic, you're a woman, you're Latina, you're bright, but then when you say Harvard, they say, oh, easy, Tiger. Those are probably not the people you need to be around. Lesson number two, dime con quien andas y te diré quien eres. Hang around with people that are saying, hey, man, when are you getting into Harvard? Let's go, let's go, let's go. You gotta get into Harvard. That's the kind of friends you need to surround yourselves with. And uh, unfortunately, in Brownsville and other places in our community, there aren't that many that have gone to Harvard. Um, but certainly, the first one that needs to determine that is you. And if you think you can do it, you can. Hope that answers the question. Last question. I have one question. It was very, very nice meeting you, uh, Mr. Paula Morris. And I wanted to ask you uh, what you can tell young people about, you know, learning our history and how that can empower future generations when they know who they are, especially, you know, when they have Mexican heritage. Yeah. And, well, and, and thank you for receiving the book that I sent you, the Abraham Lincoln in Mexico book. By, Dr. by the way, Lincoln. you should read Abraham Lincoln in Mexico. If you haven't read it, go get it. It's important. Um, you know, I think at a time like this, more than ever, communities of color and certainly the Hispanic community needs to get the facts. We need to get educated on, on our community, who we are, what we represent. Um, we have an accountability. Uh, perhaps more than any time in recent history, our community has come under attack. And right, wrong, or indifferent. If nothing else, hopefully it serves a purpose to wake us up. You guys, as I said in the speech, are the future of this country. 75% um, of the growth of new entrants into the workplace, the growth of the American work, workforce, will come from the Hispanic community. One in four children in grades kinder to 12 is of Hispanic descent. Every 30 seconds, as I said earlier, a Latino turns 18 in this country and becomes an eligible voter. That's 60 something thousand brand new voters a month. Almost, I don't know, 800, 900 brand new voters a year. If you're even alive and breathing in America right now, one in every six of you is Hispanic. So the reality of it is our community has a lot to contribute, but it's hard to contribute when you don't know the facts. So I would encourage all of you, don't make your life about what you are, make it about who you are. It's not about whether you're Latino or not, it's about what kind of a Latino you are, what kind of an American are you? And the final analysis, if you don't understand your own history, don't expect anybody else to understand it or to appreciate it. So you have a responsibility. Your grandparents are looking at you, your parents, your younger siblings, and as I said in the speech, your community and your country depends on you. What you do is going to change this country. It's going to change the world. But if you don't understand your own culture and you don't understand your own history, why should you expect that anybody else will understand it or better yet, appreciate it? So learn it, speak it out loud, and be proud of it.
Thanks. Appreciate it.